Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Jesus, and all the board of directors of uh, Tibernet for this invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. And yes, as Alberto has just mentioned, my main interest in the last, I would say, five, seven years is preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And that is mainly due because we thought from the very beginning that if we want to really make a change in disease evolution, we have to really act very, very early. And, and when we started doing all this research, I think preclinical AD was theory. I think now it's becoming a reality. And today we have seen one of the previous speakers talking about trials in preclinical AD. So I think that's answering the question, so I could go back now to my seat. But nevertheless, since I'm here, I'm going to give you some hints why I think there is reality behind the concept of Alzheimer's disease preclinical stage. So I think that for most of you, it's now very well known that the concept around AD has completely changed. 10, 20 years ago, we were talking about dementia, AD as a clinical pathological diagnosis. The field has moved forward, mainly thanks to the biomarkers, and now we understand AD as a clinical biological entity. What we actually mean with that is that the pathological side of the disease, now we can detect it through biomarkers. And again, the previous speaker this morning was talking about amyloid PET as a key biomarker. Well, that is amyloid PET, CSF biomarkers, they correlate very nicely with AD pathology. So that's why when we find those biomarkers being positive, we know that that individual is within this continuum of pathology, and now we understand that there are three main stages, being the first one, the preclinical stage, where that subject has no symptoms, but we have biomarkers evident of underlying AD pathology. From there, we move into what we call prodromal or the MCI stage of Alzheimer's disease, and then finally we enter the dementia stage of the disease. So this has been probably the most important papers related with preclinical AD. Uh, I have to admit that when these papers uh, went out, we were already working on, on preclinical AD, so I think we intu intuitively, we start doing what later was defined as preclinical AD. Because preclinical AD has been defined as this asymptomatic period of the disease where we can find, as I mentioned before, evidence of the underlying AD pathology. The process is silent, but from a pathophysiological perspective, as I'm going to be showing in the next 20 minutes, is very active. And two different types of subjects have been included within preclinical Alzheimer's disease. One of them are what is called pre-symptomatic subjects. Those were the subjects they were talking about this morning belonging to FAD families, to presently mutation families, because those are mutation carriers. So if we know that having the mutation is clearly determining that you are going to develop the disease. And as it has been mentioned this morning as well, with a mean disease onset, with a mean age of disease onset, very similar between all the members of the kindred. And that is key in order to develop the research around familial Alzheimer's disease. The other group has been called asymptomatic at risk state. Those are people who are healthy cognitive elders usually, but that we know that either they have a positive PET amyloid or a positive CSF profile. And I'm going to be giving you data of both groups. So this, just to keep it in mind, this is the biomarker cascade that uh, was launched, like I would say now, three, four years ago. What, what, what it's telling us is that it is supposed 
to obtain A beta changes before we obtain tau changes and after is when it comes brain structural changes together with clinical changes. That is quite true to some extent and, and since that concept was already launched, we were working with the idea, okay, if we start doing a research protocol in cognitively people, cog cognitively normal people that have a positive CSF profile, probably what we are targeting is this preclinical stage of the disease. So, as I said before, I'm going to show you some data in both. Presymptomatic subjects, those are uh, mutation carriers mainly of presently mutations, and later on, on asymptomatic at risk. So these are some of the papers that we published several years ago. And the first thing that we did at the time, and that, that was back in 2008, is that we really wanted to check that, um, and what we found is that as these subjects get closer to the mean age of disease onset, which here is zero, we get a lower value of CSF amyloid levels. And those amyloid levels, this subject, for example, he is 10 years before any symptom onset, like 15 years before dementia, already those amyloid values were below the cutoff point. And obviously, when they develop symptoms, which are these ones, they are already in floor levels. By contrast, we found that tau levels were starting to change around here, and they correlated very nicely with, with the appearing of symptoms. But obviously, at the time, we were very much interested in checking for cortical changes. So we, we, we are lucky enough that we had a three Tesla MRI, we could do a structural DTI, we could do functional MRI several years ago. So we performed these structural studies and obviously these are the typical changes that you observe in people with AD. Those were people belonging to those families with AD and you can see a huge loss of cortical thickness in typical AD areas. And those were people with prodromal or MCI in those families and you can see a loss of cortical thickness again in typical associative AD areas. But obviously our interest was to check what was happening in those people that as a mean they were like 15 years before disease onset. And they had no symptom obviously, so they were in this preclinical stage of the disease. And what we found at the time was something that was quite shocking because what we found in those people was an increase in cortical thickness that actually was happening in typical AD areas as well. So the first thing we did, because we, at, at that time we were wondering, is this a real change or is it an MRI artifact? So let's, let's check it. So what we observed first is that those areas that presented this increase in cortical thickness very nicely overlap with the areas that later on in that same family were going to suffer a decrease in cortical thickness. The second thing that we observe is that when we measure the ventricular system, we observe here you have healthy controls, those are asymptomatic mutation carriers, and those are the symptomatic ones. So these are the preclinical subjects. So what we were seeing was that those people with the increase in cortical thicknesses uh, actually were experiencing a decrease in the volume of the ventricular, which was, which was also significantly smaller than both healthy controls, obviously much for age scolarity, and those people that belong to the same family and obviously were symptomatic, those had atrophy already and the volume of the ventricular system was going up. So that was the first thing, the first hint thinking that make us think oh, probably this is not an artifact, something is happening very early, very early in the disease course of those people. So the second thing that we did is we correlate that with the adjusted age to disease onset. And as you can see here in blue, those are the people that are in the preclinical stage. Those are the ones that already have symptoms. And cortical thickness significantly correlated with this timing of the disease, which was something that was uh, asked, a question was asked about that this morning as well. 
So then, fair enough, we thought, okay, probably those changes that are occurring so early in time, probably they are really happening. So the second question that we, the final question we asked ourselves was, what does that mean? I mean, is that compensatory or is something else? So since we had DTI performing those subjects, we measure the mean diffusivity of the water molecules. And these are the mean diff diffusivity of the people in the family that were already demented. So you know, in people with al al very clear Alzheimer's disease, uh, there is atrophy, there is axonal loss. So water molecules diffuse wonderfully. And that's why you can see these images. By contrast, those people that presented that increase in cortical thickness show a restricted movement of water molecules. There was a reduced mean diffusivity, something that you usually see when there is astrogliosis, for example. So what we are currently thinking is that at that very early stage of the disease, probably there is some degree of inflammation in the cortex. And that's why we are getting that increase in cortical thickness. And that's why we are getting this restriction in water molecules movement. Finally, what we also did, we performed a functional MRI study. And we check for resting state, and we also check for functional MRI during encoding. And what we observed was when we were checking the resting state, we, these are the asymptomatic mutation carriers. And as you can, can see here, there is a decrease, which you can also see it here, a decrease in the posterior component of the rest, resting state and an increase in the frontal component. But what we were really interested in is looking at the encoding of those people. Those people were like, again, 15, 20 years before disease onset. They have already structural changes. They were completely normal from a clinical standpoint of view. And the functionality, when we look at it, we already observe an increase of the activity in the precunis and the posterior cingulate. As you probably know, the posterior cingulate and the precuneus during encoding usually deactivates. And it does activate when you are, again, remembering that information. So those people were doing the opposite. They were already activating the precuneus and the posterior cingulate during encoding. That, that is something that some other groups has, have also found in people at risk. For example, APOE4 carriers have present this kind of behavior in functional MRI as well. So what is telling us basically is in those people who were mutation carriers way before this is onset, the brain is clearly changing both in structure and functionality. And this change in functionality correlated very nicely with memory performance outside the machine and with, again, the time to disease onset. So to some extent, it gives us the idea that those changes do occur a long time. Obviously, this is a cross-sectional study. We have not followed them up for 20 years yet, but eventually we will, as they will, obviously, in Antioquia. This paper was published showing the same kind of, of changes in, in the whole Dayan network. And uh, res recently in Lancet Neurology, the group uh, studying the Antioquia personality mutations also published several studies showing kind of the same uh, results in the change of biomarkers. But obviously, we were as well very much interested in studying this group, which is called asymptomatic at risk. The term is asymptomatic at risk, but we have to keep in mind that those people have already amyloid in the brain. The way we did the study if there, there was amyloid was through CSF in all the studies that I'm going to show you. And we were obviously very interesting because the most frequent uh, cause of the disease is what we call sporadic. So personal mutations, as you are aware, account for a 
one percent probably of the disease. So we were interested, very very much interested to to study this preclinical stage in let's say sporadic at risk uh, subjects. Some of the papers that show these results. And the first thing that for us was quite interesting when we observed that, uh, and this was like three, four years ago, is that those people, when we test them, they were within normality. Their performance in all the cognitive battery, which you have here, most of the tests that we applied, was completely normal. But when we check them as a group, they had a distinct and significant worse performance comparing with amyloid negative controls, these are amyloid positive controls or preclinical subjects, it was they had a worse performance specifically in memory. And you can see this is the free and Q selective reminding test, a very specific test to check for the hippocampus, for hippocampal or episodic memory. So only in that test they perform significantly different. When we test them as individuals, they were within normality. And the same result was published a couple of years ago or one year ago by Reza Sperlin in, again, asymptomatic at risk. She was using A beta fluorbeta PET, and those that were fluorbeta peer positive, again, specifically in episodic memory, perform worse. And in other tests, there were no significant differences. Very interesting as well, we are talking about the preclinical stage. If we recall the cascade of biomarkers, beta amyloid is the first that changed. So in those people, when we check for correlations of cognition with biomarkers, the only biomarker that correlated with cognition was beta amyloid CSF levels. Tau and phosphotau did not show any correlation at this stage of the disease. And the other specific thing is, was that it was only with episodic memory tests. Here is the correlation with the free and Q selective reminding test, significant with a nice R value. This is with the CERAD, again. And this is with another memory test, which is the TAM that was a test that we developed for screening mainly. But only with episodic memory tests and only beta amyloid was correlating in this, let's say, preclinical stage of the disease. And again, we were very much interested in checking for MRI. So we, at that moment, we had those, let's say, for us at least, fascinating results in those pre-symptomatic significant relationship in any of the type of relationship. What, what this was telling us was that at some point that the beta amyloid levels are coming down, cortical thickness is going to increase. That's why the relationship is either quadratic or cubic. So then we decide to analyze comparing this population in tertiles. So the middle tertile were those ones that had the beta amyloid levels in the range of change. And what we observed in the typical AD areas, again, was an increase in cortical thickness. So to some extent, the paradox for us was resolved. Obviously, I mean, this is, these are cross-sectional data, so we need longitudinal data with people who are very far away from clinical disease onset. Now there are many cohorts that are starting with people without, even without amyloid, so we will be able to check all these sequences of events in a longitudinal fashion, which is really of value. But our idea right now is that very early, very early in the preclinical stage, very likely when those beta amyloid levels are changing in the CSF, when amyloid is starting to deposit in the brain, then we may be getting this increase in cortical thickness, which may be related with astrogliosis. Later on, as, as the preclinical stage goes by, then we get this decrease in cortical thickness, and that's why when we dichotomize the population, we see a decrease in cortical thickness already in preclinical subjects. Finally, we perform another functional MRI study, and Actually, what we found was exactly the same result that we had found in 
mutation carriers, that there was an increase in the bold response in the precuneus during encoding in those people that were asymptomatic but with low CSF beta amyloid levels. We've been studying, and I'm finishing uh, with the next uh, two, three slides. We have been studying in the last years the relationship between cognitive reserve and structural and functional changes in the brain. In typically in normal subjects, people with AD, even people with MCI. So we wanted to understand what was the relationship in those people that were in the preclinical stage of the disease. As you know, the cognitive uh, reserve hypothesis states that when you are normal, if you have greater cognitive reserve, usually from a structural point of view, your brain is, let's say, in a simple way, bigger, and you have usually in the same task a decrease in, in functional activation of the brain because it does operate much, uh, let's say, much better or faster than a peop someone with a lower cognitive reserve. But that relationship gets inverted when you develop the disease. And that is supposed to be because when you develop the disease, those people with greater cognitive reserve are able to compensate for pathological changes in the brain for longer time. So at, when you detect the disease, the brain has greater atrophy and they increment functionality in, in functional MRI in order to compensate. But actually what we found in this preclinical group, and you can see it here, those are the people that were controls. These are the preclinical subjects. This is the hippocampus and this is the supramarginal gyrus, in these two specific areas, we already observe this inverse relationship, which means that if you have greater cognitive reserve, the greater your cognitive reserve is, the smaller already in this preclinical stage your brain is. I would like to mention the ABLE study because they have been tried through this kind of statistical analysis to understand the timing of these preclinical changes. And, and what they are now postulating is that when you start getting amyloid in your brain, it takes like 12 years in order to get a full load of amyloid in the brain. And then you are starting this preclinical stage and it takes 19 years to start developing symptoms. So, for them, this preclinical stage may last around 20 years, and the amyloid deposition stage may last around 10 more years. So we are talking a very long disease then. We are talking a disease that really, if you are going to develop it when you are 70, probably you are starting it when you are 40 from a biological perspective. So it's not a disease of old people anymore. And finally, yes, to convince you, but after today's early morning presentation, I think you were already convinced that the preclinical stage is a reality. But this is a very nice uh, Lancet neurology that came out one week ago. And this is a cohort of, of people uh, from Washington University where they already started a very large uh, program with asymptomatic subjects. And in the preclinical, I didn't mention it before, but already there is some staging within the preclinical stage. So there is a stage, this is normal group, a stage one, a stage two, and a stage three. A stage one are people, normal cognition, only amyloid in the brain. A stage two are normal co cognition, amyloid, and positivity of neuronal injury markers like tau, for example, or others. A stage three, there is cognit no, cogni no cognitive symptoms at all, amyloid in the brain, positivity of neuronal injury markers, and already some subtle cognitive deficit. So these are supposed to, to be closer to the disease onset, and when they perform this longitudinal study, they observe that in five years' time, 5% of these people already develop clear symptoms, 
like 20% of these people already develop, 20, 25% of these people already develop clinical symptoms, and 50% of these people move into the prodromal stage of the disease. So I think there are no doubts that the preclinical stage is a reality. This is very important, and, and it has been mentioned this morning, in order to do, right now, secondary prevention trials, that the one they were explaining this morning, uh, you should know that there are just about to start three trials in at three well known because I know there are going to start more, which maybe not are they are not as well designed and, as these three, but three clinical trials in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. One of them is in Colombia, the second one is in this con and in the Dayan consortium, which is a consortium of a dominant inherited Alzheimer's disease, the dominant inherited Alzheimer's disease network. And the third one is in people who are at risk. That, that one is led by Paul Eisen and, and Rachel Sperling. Uh, it's called the E4 trial, and they are aiming to include over 1,000 people with no symptoms, positive amyloid in the brain, and check if the drug that they are going to give is going to slow down what we were showing right here, the possibility of entering the clinical stage of the disease. So with this, I finish. I think I have been saying my key messages during the whole talk. I think that the interaction between biomarkers and, and Alzheimer's disease are distinct along the whole continuum. They are changing depending on the stage of the disease. I think that the preclinical stage, I have very few doubts that it is biological active. There are no symptoms, and I think that one of the great confounders until now is that many people were thinking, well, maybe not every one of those people develop AD. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you enter the preclinical stage when you are 80, very likely you are going to die before you develop the symptoms. But that does not mean that this preclinical stage is not a reality. I think there is structural and functional changes, and it's a very long duration stage. I'm thanking you for all your attention and thanking all the people that work with me. Thank you. Any, any questions? Pablo, Pablo Martínez Laje. Congratulations once again for all your work to you and, and, and your team. Um, I always have the same question and I beg your pardon for this. So I'm going to try to formulate it some other way. I think I know the question. What is the value you give to subjective memory complaints in these people? Okay, let's forget about the concept from Bryce Sperling. Uh, she includes these people in the preclinical concept. Let's forget about that. But from the public health point of view, I think it's very important to differentiate people with preclinical Alzheimer's that you go out to look for in the community or preclinical Alzheimer's that come to the memory clinics. So what is the value of subjective memory complaints as a symptom, in yes. your opinion? No, no Pablo, I, I, I fully agree with you, and I, I think that's an important question. I mean, we, we had in Boston a meeting because there a subjective cognitive complaint a consortium was created, we, we were invited to participate, and we discussed for hours. And it's, it's not an easy subject. I mean, I think we have to differentiate between what is research and, and what is our clinical work. Uh, we have to keep in mind that preclinical AD right now is research. Uh, so when we get people with subjective complaints and they have, if they have positive amyloid and positive tau markers, for example, we know they are very close to the clinical stage. They are closer than those that do not have the complaints. And we need longitudinal studies and multicenter studies on this to really corroborate that. 
but that's what usually happens. The thing is that, uh, as you know, because we have discussed this many times, uh, we are trying to push the diagnosis earlier. We are trying to push the diagnosis into the prodromal stage. In the prodromal stage, you have a very clear symptom, which is episodic memory deficit that you can measure, you can use specific tests, and we know that when you have markers plus episodic memory dysfunction, you are three years from dementia. So it will be very easy to make the diagnosis supported with biomarkers at that stage, but still, there are many people reluctant to make Alzheimer's disease diagnosis when you are not demented. So if we translate that information into subjective complaints, which are non-specific, they are, I mean, you can have them in the AD continuum context, you can have it in a depression context, you can have it in a neurotic a personality context. So then, to move that information into our clinical work is even much more complicated. So, we're, we're, my personal position right now, I, I push hard to try to move the diagnosis of AD into the prodromal stage, because we have to admit, Alzheimer's disease is the only neurodegenerative stage that is diagnosed too late I mean, if you get someone with tremor in one hand and it's a clear resting tremor, all the neurologists will make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. If you get someone with a clear episodic memory deficit and positive biomarkers in the CSF in PET, people are reluctant to make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. We're a paradox, but that's what we are living with. So I focus to make the early diagnosis into the prodromal stage and I my personal experience with subjective complaints in this preclinical stage is that they are closer to the clinical stage. Sorry for the long answer. I always love talking. Thank you. I have one short question. Um, you hypothesized that there is like this uh, increased cortical thickness was due to maybe an inflammatory reaction. And uh, I mean, there are uh, inflammation ligands that you can use with PET, but they're very complicated. But you have the CSF, so the question is, have you looked at inflammatory markers in the CSF? We have. At, at this stage. Yeah, we have, we have, we have looked at YKL40. And uh, YKL40, as you know, it's increased in AD and prodromal AD, and we found that. We do not find a clear in increment in preclinical AD, but we find, which is very interesting, a correlation of YKL40 with tau and phosphotau in the preclinical stage, which but we think that correlation is telling us that there is some relationship in, into the disease pathogenesis with that inflammatory marker at the preclinical stage. That's our hypothesis. I know that Agneta Norbert with, with PET is finding some inflammatory changes early in the disease course as well. So I think the field is open now into what inflammation is doing in the AD brain at early stages now. No, thank you.